Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. We'll be starting shortly. We're waiting for a few more participants to log in. They're in the meeting room. Uh, just give us a few more minutes and then we'll start. Good morning, already over 40 participants. Let's wait a few more minutes and then we start. Good morning, everybody. You see that many people have been coming in already. Somewhere in the videos, you also see uh, Iris Martens, who's making a live drawing of the webinar. Uh, we'll hope to be able to share the results at the end of this webinar. We'll be starting in uh, one minute. Charlotte, you're not on mute. Yes, no. Okay. But mute yourself. As soon as Charlotte, her screen is visible to everybody, we will start this webinar. Yeah, but so, someone put my screen on pause, so I can't share it now. Right there. Uh, okay. Resume share? No. New share? Okay, try again. Now everyone can see it, I guess. No? Yes, okay. we can. Put it at full screen, please. Full screen.
Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, welcome everybody to this second webinar in this series uh, about uh, artisanal um, and small scale mining in a fair global supply chain. So this webinar is part of a webinar series uh, which aims towards a responsible supply chain for electronics uh, from mining to manufacturing. The last webinar was, uh, the first webinar was on Monday. Uh, and then today we have the second and the last one will be tomorrow. Uh, here you can see the program. So if you'd like to join for the webinar uh, same time tomorrow, please do so. Uh, we'll deal with the trade union rights in the global electronics industry and, and we'll focus on the case of Indonesia. Uh, with this said already, many thanks of course to the organizers for having us um, this webinar is part of the Make ICT Fair project, which is also supported by the Fair ICT Flanders project, and then K Leuven Sim Square, the Sustainable uh, Minerals and Metals Institute of Leuven, is also involved in the organization of this webinar. Um, so we have three speakers today. I'll introduce them shortly. Um, if you have questions during their presentations, please do write them in the chat box. Um, if the question is to a particular speaker, also do mention that. Um, if possible, if you can add uh, from which um, background you yourself are to um, understand uh, your reasoning, that would be nice as well. Um, participants are on mute, uh, but maybe for some questions we can allow the participants to um, speak out and, and ask the questions live. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that for everybody, so we'll do a big uh, pick here and there. Um, so please do communicate in the chat box. Um, there's uh, one person with, uh, which is called questions. You can address the questions privately to that person or just preferably do it in the general chat box. Um, as you might have seen, we are recording the session as well. Um, feel free to switch off your camera if you don't want to be in, uh, in the screen. Um, so don't hesitate to um, do so. Um, the recording is, of course, only for uh, the report of this webinar, so we can have a good um, understanding of what has been said, what has been taken. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, Iris is in charge of making a graphic design on the content of this webinar, so she already started drawing uh, from her house. Um, so the drawing, you can uh, click on it if you click on her video, but we'll be sharing it later on. Um, this webinar is uh, intended to be a bit more interactive than the general webinar where you just sit and listen. Uh, I hope you all have a nice coffee or some water or something, but the idea is also that you participate actively. So each speaker will start with a poll. Um, we'll uh, give you a demonstration of that poll. Um, can you please launch my poll, Zlatka? So we'd like to know where everybody is from. So if all goes well, you are now seeing uh, the question, which type of organization do you work for? And you can start voting. I see the votes coming in very fast, perfect. So either private sector, governmental organization, NGO, civil society organization, academia, research institution, or international organization. Uh, I see that the uh, votes are coming in. Uh, i give you a few more seconds. Um, this is not uh, scientific data, of course. If you would have missed voted or if you feel like I'm in two or more or more different kinds of organizations, don't worry, it's just to have an idea of where we are now. So we've closed the polling. Uh, can you share the results? Voila, so uh, normally if everything's well, you see the results that the audience is quite diverse with, let's say the three main ones is uh, NGO, academias and civil society, uh, private sector, sorry. Um, so we have quite a diverse audience uh, and I'm very curious also to understand if that leads into diverse opinions about uh, the speakers, their presentations. So thank you very much for that poll. So you see already that we tried to make this a little bit more attractive. Um, so we'll have uh, the three speakers. We'll start with Boris in a minute. Uh, he will start also with a poll. So they all have about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes to make a statement. And then afterwards, we can have uh, a Q&A with the speakers and a short debate with the participants. Uh, please do add your questions in the, uh, in the chat box. So let's start immediately with um, Boris. 
Um, so as you can see, Boris is a senior researcher at the HIVA Institute in Leuven. He's a postdoctoral research fellow at EUB as well, uh, and he completed a PhD on informal gold mining in the Philippines already back in 2015, and has been keeping track of the topic uh, ever since. Um, at the HIVA Institute, Boris is currently conducting a policy-oriented research on social sustainability of supply chains, um, so that's his job in Leuven and in Antwerp, very complementary to this. Um, he's now a three-year FVO, he's involved in a three-year funded uh, research from FVO, FWO, and that looks into the integration of informal gold, gold mining in the global gold production system. So we're very happy that we have Boris on board to um, give an opening statement on the topic of this webinar. So please, Boris, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Pete. I will now start sharing my screen. If it doesn't go well, please alert me. It should be there now. Yes, perfect. Um, okay, yeah. so first of all, thanks for uh, for introducing me. Um, I was asked by uh, Katapa and, and um, I, I happily um, agreed to give a short critical introduction to the topic of artisanal and small scale mining. Uh, so I don't need to introduce myself. A uh, special word of thanks also to my uh, colleague Eugenia at the University of Antwerp for allowing me to use her uh, some of her pictures. Um, so what I will try to do today, and it's quite an ambitious agenda for 20 minutes, I will try to answer four questions. First of all, what, what is artisanal and small scale mining? Secondly, what drives uh, the expansion of artisanal and small scale mining? Thirdly, what are the key challenges? And fourthly, what are the, the key policy responses and do they address these challenges? So before proceeding, I also have a short poll, which we can launch now. Okay. So um, worldwide, what is the estimated number of people involved in artisanal and small scale mining? Okay, I don't see any more answers coming in, so I guess we can end here. I will return to this, uh, to this question later on in the presentation. Okay, so I should close this now. So the first question, um, wait, my screen. Okay, so the first question, what is artisanal and small scale mining? So generally speaking, it's defined as labor intensive, low tech mineral extraction, as well as processing. Um, it's predominantly informal activity. So estimates suggest that 70 to 80% of uh, artisanal small scale mining activity proceeds without a permit or a license. But this is an estimate because of course, it's an informal activity, which means that it's very difficult to estimate. Um, artisanal small scale mining targets a wide range of minerals. So these are three of the more common ones. So we have uh, coltan, uh, we have cobalt, sorry, uh, diamonds, as well as gold. But aside from these, there's also, uh, for instance, tin, um, tungsten, as well as gems and uh, mica, which is a product used to, to give the shiny, uh, the shiny flavor to, uh, to your makeup. Uh, ASM is also very heterogeneous in terms of the types of activities we find. Uh, so this, for instance, is a picture taken in Colombia, with a, which is called hydraulic mining. This is a picture from the Philippines, underground gold mining. And this is a picture taken in, uh, in the DRC, where these people basically use a dredge to mine the, the bed of the river, again for gold. So uh, in recent decades, especially recent years, we've seen a spectacular expansion of, uh, of artisanal small scale mining. Um, the number of people involved in mining is actually 40 million. So that's the, I mean, again, it's an estimate. So that's the answer to the, the question in the poll. Um, but particularly since let's say around 2010, there has been a, a massive growth, which is mainly due to uh, increased global mineral demands and uh, especially gold prices, which have skyrocketed because gold again remains the, the primary target of artisanal and small scale miners worldwide. 
So it's a, it's a global phenomenon, but at the same time, it's concentrated primarily in low and middle income countries. So this, uh, this map is it's a bit outdated, but gives an indication of the, the amount of people involved in artisanal small scale mining. So we see mainly Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but also East and Southeast Asia. That brings us to the second question. So what drives the expansion of artisanal and small scale mining? So for a very long time, the image of the sector has been dominated by ideas about opportunity and an idea that people get, could get rich quick. So this is a, this is a drawing from the, the era of the US gold rush. So the idea that people go to, for instance, gold mines to strike it rich and, and have a new life. But I think today we can safely say that uh, the consensus among scholars and amongst most observers is that the key driving factor of artisanal small-scale mining expansion is poverty. Um, subsistence needs, again, mostly in developing countries, are driving people to, uh, to the gold mines, to the, the uh, artisanal mines, diamond mines, coltan mines. Um, the problem is that while poverty can explain the, um, the unrelenting supply of new labor recruits in the sector, it doesn't explain why we see so many advanced um, artisanal and small scale mining activities, which no longer corresponds to the definition that I gave earlier. So this, for instance, is a picture I took in the Philippines, uh, which is a massive gold mine that employs uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people. This is a picture that was taken in, uh, in Ghana. And this is a, no, actually this was a picture taken in, uh, in Colombia and this is a picture taken in Ghana. So we see that these are, um, technically speaking, these are referred to as um, small scale mines or illegal mines. But in reality, as you see, these are not, are no longer small scale mines. But still it's, <clears throat> it's put under this container uh, term, artisanal small scale mining. This image of, uh, of artisanal small-scale mining as subsistence activity also doesn't, uh, doesn't do justice to the fact that, for, for instance, for uh, tantalum, tin, and gold, artisanal miners are producing approximately one quarter of uh, total mineral output worldwide. And again, these are estimates, but still there's, um, there's clear indications that this is not a marginal phenomenon. Uh, this is actually increasingly important for, uh, for the global mineral supply. So what we try to do in our research in, uh, at the University of Antwerp is to try to offer an alternative explanation for this, this expansion of artisanal small-scale mining, which treats it as a systemic phenomenon. Uh, so what we are saying is that you should look at this expansion not as a, as a kind of bottom-up response to, to poverty alone, but it's also part of a bigger system. It's, uh, this expansion can be explained as um, being part of structural trends in, uh, in the global mining system. So first of all, this argument is based on uh, primarily on gold, but I think it also has explanatory power in the in the case of other minerals. So first of all, we see that um, that the global mining industry is faced with scarcity, especially in the case of gold. There's uh, there's less and less reserves that can be profitably mined on an industrial scale. Uh, so there's people claiming that we're at peak gold, meaning that we have reached the maximal production and in the future we will not be able to recover uh, at least the amount of gold that is needed to, to, um, to respond to the demand. So what artisanal small-scale mining does as opposed to industrial mining is it targets small and diffuse deposits that would otherwise be unattractive for, for industrial mining companies. So this type of alluvial smaller deposits. A second uh, major factor, of course, in the, in the mining industry is increased resistance, not only on the part of local communities, but also increasingly on the part of governments who want their fair share in, uh, in mining. And this, of course, um, represents a, a cost and a challenge for the mining industry. Uh, it, it increases costs, it um, increases the, the hassle, and rightly so, I would say, of, uh, of opening a new mining project, in, in, uh, especially in, in, remote, um, in remote areas in developing countries. So what artisanal mining does, it, it tends to overcome this, this, um, this resistance and it tends to draw in local populations precisely by, by having a potential to realize development, by offering opportunities to local population, to local um, authorities to become involved in this economy, much more so I would say than, than uh, large-scale industrial mining. And then thirdly, there's the issue of costs. 
which uh, is a very context specific issue, of course, but operating in remote environments um, and, and increasingly technologically intensive sector, of course, comes with huge costs. And the, I would say that the primary, uh, the primary characteristic of artisanal small scale mining is its ability to mobilize, first of all, cheap labor. But secondly, also what I would say, uh, what you could call cheap nature. So you can basically extract nature without having um, regulatory controls, without having anyone saying what you can or cannot do. Um, treating artisanal small scale mining as a systemic phenomenon also means paying attention to the ways in which it's integrated into the global economy. So it's not, again, a marginal phenomenon taking place at the margins or even outside of the global economy. It's something that is tightly integrated into global trading networks, into the global, um, in this case, the global gold production system. But I think that um, value chains in other uh, mineral sectors are equally, if not more complex. Okay, so having established the fact that ASM is also a systemic phenomenon, what are the key challenges? So the, the most visible one, this is a picture taken in uh, Madre de Dios in uh, Peru, is uh, deforestation, um, soil erosion, uh, siltation. I'm not an expert in this, but clearly this is a very dramatic impact. Um, also in terms of the use of, of toxic chem chemicals, the, the primary focus has been so far on the use of mercury, mainly in gold mining. Uh, so mercury, which is used to capture gold particles and, if, and after that is then torched, which um, in both cases has, has severe risks for, uh, for human and environmental health. But in recent years, we're seeing increased use of cyanide as well in artisanal small-scale mining, uh, often in combination, which again, I'm not an expert, but I was told that this is a particularly problematic combination. So cyanide mercury complexes tend to be very destructive, again, for, for both human and environment. Um, so this, the, the top picture was taken in Burkina by a colleague working on artisanal gold mining in Burkina Faso. The bottom picture was taken by myself, bottom right in, uh, in the Philippines. And these are large tanks where basically the, the, the gold slurry is mixed together with cyanide and a range of other chemicals and is then released um, in the environment. And then the other and probably most, most famous or infamous uh, challenge facing artisanal small-scale mining is the issue of conflict minerals, which, which essentially relates to how, um, how revenues from artisanal mining are either funding um, armed conflict or are the major cause of armed conflict, basically uh, warring parties fighting over access to, to, um, to revenues from artisanal small-scale gold mining. Um, that said, I think, and together with, with uh, several of my colleagues, that the key challenge in the sector, um, despite the focus on, on child labor, on um, conflict minerals, on uh, environmental pollution, is the issue of undecent work. And undecent work, I think, is much more nuanced than simply saying there's a lot of slavery, there's a lot of child labor. It's about the fact that um, labor and, and working in artisanal mining is often very hazardous, very dangerous, people lacking decent uh, protective equipment. It's often underpaid because, again, I think exploitation is one of the key, uh, the key characteristics of artisanal small-scale mining. It's informal, which also implies that uh, the people active in this, this artisanal small-scale mining economy tend not to have access to social protection, which, of course, is something that would be very welcome in a context like this. Um, so these, these, um, these observations somehow raise the issue of, of undecent work, which is very pervasive. But at the same time, it's always important to, re to remember that for a lot of people, uh, working in the sector can also be emancipatory. So it has the potential to actually, um, to actually give people opportunities and to be socially mobile. And that, that is something that is often forgotten. It's often seen as a social ill and not necessarily as a, a lever for social change. So the question then becomes, and I don't know how I'm doing time-wise, um, but I've, I've reached my final part. Okay, great. Um, so how does and does policy respond to these challenges? And mainly, I would say, to the issue of, uh, of, of undecent work. Because undecent work, um, and that's also important to, to bear in mind, I also believe that undecent work lies at the root of many of the, the other challenges facing the sector. So even in the case of mercury use, the, the fact that people continue to use mercury often also has a social explanation, meaning that it, it allows them, and I can elaborate on that later on if, if needed, but it allows them to somehow reap a share of the benefits that would otherwise go lost to other actors in the, in the value chain. Um, so in terms of policy responses, um, I would say that at the level of national government, the focus has been, um, has been either 
on um, eradicating what is referred to as illegal mining. So a lot of countries, uh, especially I would say Latin America, to a lesser extent also Southeast Asia and, and Sub-Saharan Africa, are sending in the army or police to, to destroy mines, to uh, destroy equipment, and to eradicate this uh, social ill. A lot of countries are combining or are focusing their efforts not on eradication alone, but are also trying to formalize the activity. Formalization is seen as a, and I think rightly so, as, a, as an indispensable first step towards regulating the sector. So this, for instance, is the, the, the act regulating the formalization of artisanal small scale mining in the Philippines. So a lot of governments are trying to somehow formalize the activity. Uh, although I, I think it's important to note there that in a lot of cases, the focus is squarely on giving people access to mineral property rights and not so much on protecting um, those who are most vulnerable, meaning to say the, the workers actually in, in this uh, artisanal small scale mining economy. So giving people permits, but not necessarily giving workers worker rights. At the global level, then, I think the focus has mostly been, um, of course, there's other issues at play, but the focus has mostly been on, on conflict, conflict minerals and how we can get conflict-free minerals. So at the level of OECD, there's due diligence guidelines uh, for responsible supply chains of minerals, focusing on conflict-affected and high-risk areas. The World Gold Council has developed a conflict-free gold standard. And as many of you might know, might know uh, in 2021, there will be new European legislation, which basically tries to uh, to, to root out um, conflict minerals in supply chains that, that come to Europe. Um, so this EU conflict minerals regulation, again, focused on the issue of, of conflict minerals, although in, in wording, they will also refer to human rights. The focus is often on transparency and making sure that there's no conflict minerals. Um, a second, a second area of attention in global policy, but also at the national level, is the, the idea of clean minerals. So we need, uh, especially in the case of gold, we need mercury-free minerals, uh, mercury-free gold. Uh, people have been trying to set up, um, and, and with very good intentions, trying to set up new processing techniques without the use of mercury. Uh, but what we see is that in a lot of cases, mercury use continues despite the availability of new and clean technology. And another challenge is, as I said, um, some of these initiatives risk running behind facts in the sense that there's there's now be uh, there's a clear shift visible from um, from a, an exclusive reliance on mercury towards a combination of mercury and cyanide, or even exclusively the use of cyanide. So that's clearly an issue for the future. So that brings me to the um, to the final question. How about the issue of decent work, which again, I would say is a, is a crucial one if you want to address these other challenges in the sector. Um, there have been, of course, a number of, uh, of clear initiatives that target um, fair gold in this case. So we have fair trade gold, we have fair mine gold. Uh, the, the, the thing there is that these initiatives um, struggle with uh, some issues uh, which, which have also faced fair trade more broadly, I would say. But in the case of gold, there's additional issues such as the fact that the premium given for gold is not always enough in terms of an incentive to actually sell to, um, to fair trade. People often have an incentive to sell on the local informal market rather than to, to fair trade. Um, so that's one of the challenges. And our challenge is the fact that uh, the, the social dynamics within the cooperatives uh, targeted by, by fair trade are not necessarily, and by fair mind, are not necessarily fully taken into account. Um, that said, I think uh, there is potential for this scheme, be it for a, a limited portion of the global gold market. Uh, the, the positive note to end my presentation is the fact that in recent years we're seeing a new generation of, uh, of um, sustainable mineral supply chain initiatives and, and two examples and I will not go into uh, detail here also because I don't really know the details of the, the first one especially the Fair Cobalt Alliance and the, the craft scheme um, I think are two examples of how things could be different um, in both cases they uh, they tend to um, they tend to promote a whole of change approach which tries to situate artisanal small-scale mining within this entire value chain but it also in both cases entails a more open-ended approach to what actually matters on the ground They're really trying to work together with um, artisanal small-scale mining communities to identify what really matters for those active inside the mines and I think that should be the, the first step towards any um, any attempt to uh, to address the challenges facing the sector 
Okay, so that's that was my presentation. I thank you for uh, for listening to me. And if there's any questions, of course, we can uh, get back to those later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boris. Um, as you all see, um, Zoom also allows to clap virtually, which I enthusiastically do for Boris's presentation on this uh, very complex but very interesting um, issue of artisanal um, and small scale mining, which seems not always to be that small scale, um, but has also a very strong impact. And then the question is how can we reduce that impact so that issues like undecent work um, would be at least reduced, if not uh, completely converted. Uh, interesting to see also that new initiatives are popping up, trying to change those realities on the ground. Um, I would like to thank uh, Michael very much for his comment he made in the chat box, uh, where he added that the Delft platform provides global data on artisanal small-scale mining. Uh, so we can have a look at the chat box to find the link. Um, then uh, there was a question also, maybe Boris can answer that question later in the chat box, uh, in the chat box or either in, in the end debate, um, where the question was from Vicente Guterres from Spain, uh, to know where the expansion of artisanal and small-scale mining was not only of the number of people employed, but how about the mining tonnage, uh, how many, uh, minerals is being dug up if there's an increase there as well. Um, please continue to ask your questions in the chat box. Um, so we've seen now that indeed uh, artisanal and small-scale mining has a uh, strong impact, uh, has many different sides to it, um, both an emancipatory potential but also um, difficult working conditions. Uh, let's continue with our next speaker which is Professor Eric Smolders uh, who will give some more insights on uh, specific case in this respect. Um, Professor Eric Smolders is an uh, environmental chemist with expertise in soil science and environmental tox toxicology. He has a master in uh, surface chemistry of the University of Leuven, where he also did a PhD in agricultural sciences. Um, he did various, various uh, postdoctoral studies um, at the Imperial College in UK, at uh, CSIRO, um, et cetera, et cetera. Long career, um, but he's now a full uh, professor at K. Leuven, teaching environmental chemistry and organic chemistry, environmental toxicology. Um, and we invited him, uh, especially for research he had done in the DRC. Uh, he's also um, an advisor for the environmental risk assessment for the Flemish government, uh, the OVAM for the people in Flanders. Um, and he's also um, heavily linked, well, heavily linked, no, he's uh, supporting the federal government in terms of health, food chain, safety, and environment, uh, and also does the same for the European Commission. So please, Eric, you have the floor to uh, share your insights on the artisanal scope and small scale mining. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this all clear to everybody? Pete, is that okay? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, now just see whether I can use my pointer. Yeah, okay. So welcome everybody. I will uh, present the work that we did in Congo, um, which started about 10 years ago and that we did it in a, in a project together with the people from the biomedical faculty of Leuven. And that's uh, more particularly with Professor Nemery, who is now a retired professor as a lung toxicologist. And not surprisingly, it was about cobalt because uh, Benoit Nemery has made his career about uh, cobalt in um, all his life. Um, in 2009, we started by monitoring um, um, the, um, the, the zone of what we call the African Copper Belt, which is the south of Congo, and which has been heavily used in the past for copper mining and for uranium mining. Notably, the bomb of Hiroshima has been made with uranium um, from this area that the Belgians have mined and exported to U.S. At the moment, that mining of copper is reduced and what is of course intensified since about 2000 is the cobalt mining. There is still uranium mining going on, but the cobalt is now the main activity in the towns of Lubumbashi, Likasi and Kolwesi. And about 2000, in 2009, we first started with a biomonitoring to, to identify um, how how much of the metals are, exp um, are then brought into the environment and to what extent are the people, the general population, are exposed to these 
metals. And we did the whole series of metals and our first study and publication was about this, showing that not surprisingly, people living closer to the mines had more metals in their body, in their body burden, um, than further away. And the primary mineral was cobalt, not lead, not uranium, uh, uh, and not cadmium, but it was mainly cobalt, and it was mainly in children. And what was the most surprising thing is that there's a lot of outliers. Well, the distribution was very, very skewed. There's a few uh, people who are really highly exposed to cobalt. And always in risk assessment, we do not protect the average. We have to protect the upper percentile. It's just like with Corona, we do wear masks, even though the average person is not so vulnerable, but because some people are vulnerable. So in risk assessment, you always have to look to the upper percentiles and not to the average. Average is indicative of something, but we look at upper percentiles. There is also a poll, and maybe uh, Zlatka can uh, bring in these questions already now. I don't see the questions. Zlatka, are they coming on the screen yet? Yeah, here are the questions. Um, <clears throat> you can read these questions, long questions, <laughs> well, long answers, and I give you time to think about this and answer, try to answer that. Uh, I guess most of you will not know the answer yet, um, but you can try already. <clears throat> I see answers coming in. <clears throat> this is actually the sad part for the participants, Eric. We can see the answers coming in, but they don't. Ah, okay. I'll, so we I'll... see how the bars are moving and which one is winning, let's say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they don't. So... I'll give the answer then later, but I can also say that, yeah. <clears throat> So to know the answer, okay. keep listening in very intensively. Thank you. Okay. Well, I can tell to the people that 11% goes for answer one, 28 for answer two, and, and uh, 61 goes to answer three. You will see what comes out. Yep. Okay. Here we go. So we observed that there's a lot of cobalt exposure to the children and very high cobalt exposure for those people who have been working on in instruments in the lab. Well, the concentrations go to up to half a milligram of cobalt per liter urine. So the samples we take as a urine sample, very simple to, end, to take. Well, with an old atomic absorption, which you may have seen and used in the past in your bachelor chemistry thing, which is absolutely not the traditional instruments any more, any longer, because that's old fashioned instrument, you could already measure that. So you don't need fancy equipment. Half a milligram cobalt is really a lot of the, that is about a thousand times above the normal concentration that people have in their body. Okay, we go on. Oh, I tried to move. The exposure to metals in the general population can go to various routes. You can have air, inhalation, you can have drinking water, you can have the food that is contaminated, or you can have some accidental dust intake. Dust is just what is in your fingers and that you accidentally lick in your fingers or that is adhering to the, to the food and then you get dust inside. Question is, what is now the route by which people in around the minings and then especially around artisanal uh, miners, um, the people living around these artisanal mines, are exposed to. What we did is we did an exposure assessment, which is in between medical and environmental research. And this is the, the paper that we wrote about it, which is very simple. You go to the, to the environment, you look what the people are eating, drinking, how they are exposed, and you take a lot of samples of the, the food they, ta they take uh, from the kitchen garden, um, from the cassava, from the fish, because people have been saying, well, the lake is polluted, so therefore the people are um, contaminated by eating fish that is heavily contaminated. But what you do is not only sample these things and analyze for metals, but you also do questionnaires about how much people are eating. And like fish, people are eating fish only once a week. 
because there's not much proteins there and then they, they know for sustainable food supply, don't eat too much fish or meat, etc. We also took samples of the dust just with a dust pen, inside dust and outside dust. Here is an outside dust sample that we take and collect that. And you're not supposed to read all these numbers, but what it shows that you have the control area, you take samples from an area far away from the mines or from the red, the polluted areas, and then you see how much they're different. I mean, the, the staple food is maize flour, that's for example, eight times higher in the polluted areas than in the control or lake site. And they're all higher, all these concentrations, not surprisingly. And for example, also the fish in the lakeside area, that is a, a, a lake close to Likasi, well-known lake that is polluted by effluents from the mining operations, is that uh, the fish is 20 times more contaminated than in a reference area. And then you do then the exposure assessment, you multiply what they eat uh, and what the composition is to find out in the polluted area, in the different areas, that they have really much higher cobalt intake. Here's an assessment for children. The size of the pie is proportional to the amount the, the people ingest of here, the cobalt. We did that for the various metals. And you see, for example, in the control area, there's only 29 micrograms intake in the polluted area, 352. And then is a the question, what is in the pie? Where is it coming from? Well, in summary, it's written here that in a control area far away from the mines, 90% of the cobalt that people are exposed to comes from the maize flour. But in the polluted area, it is the home ground vegetables that even if they're washed as the people do, and even if the people eat very little vegetables, it's still the major source of the cobalt and the dust. Now, the dust intake was a very unknown for us. We can measure the composition of the dust, but you cannot ask the people, how much dust do you eat? Now think about yourself, how much dust would you eat? It's not in a poll. Well, in risk assessments in Europe and in America, we take a 50 milligrams, so that's 0 0.05 milligram as dust for an adult as a worst case. And for children, we can go up to 100 milligram, or in other words, 0 0.1 gram of dust. That is because children are playing in the, say, outside and they, they don't wash their hands and they lick their fingers and so on. That is what we take in risk assessment. But if you look around there in Congo, people are covered with dust. We wanted to know better how much dust do you eat? And rather than asking or looking at people like these children who are eating dust or playing around or whatever, you can estimate that it is high, but you have to measure. So we did the measurement and this is what we did. Um, and this was published only last year. A study that, we, that I um, supervised in which, and you have to read the last line, you can estimate a dust ingestion of an individual based on collecting its fecal excretion. So collecting all the feces during um, four days, it was a bit of a smelly operation, of course, and you measure tracers here, niobium, um, titanium and vanadium, as a tracer for the dust, because these elements are not absorbed in the gut. So they're just, they're going in with the dust and they're excreted again. You analyze the concentrations in the fecal matter and you also analyze this tracer in the dust. And then you can calculate by the mass balance approach, how much dust they, you take in. It is corrected for these tracers presence in the food. So we also collected duplicate meals of each individual we collected what, did he, what he is or he or she is eating. So that's basically the mass balance. You collect the, the fecal matter, you analyze the tracer and you record what this person has been eating. You subtract these tracers and the food from that and then you are left over with the dust. And then we came up with that title that we had never seen before in ever, in ever assessment that was mainly done in Europe or in, 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 um, in, in the US, such high dust estimates. Our geometric mean was 0 0.28 gram per day and the 95th percentile was an unbelievable number of 13 grams of dust per day. So these are 10 times the common default values. 
and also that we had more in the dry season and that women had more dust intake than men, but that is most likely because of geophagy. So when they're pregnant, they believe that if they eat soil or dust, that, they're, that the, the, their newborn will be more healthy. On the right, you see this, the, the data, individual data. Each dot is an individual person, and it's a log scale, and it's not milligrams, but grams. So the value that we use in risk assessment, the maximum for children is 0 0.1 gram. You can see how, many, how, how high this is. It is not surprising for people who have been traveling to uh, or visiting um, such countries and seeing these artisanal mining, but we needed these high numbers. Of course, that's the exposure. So now we know that, that dust intake, and that was also the answer uh, the, uh, to the poll, the third was, a, it's not drinking water or fish eating, but it's just dust, dust, and dust. That is the major exposure route. Question is, health impact. And this is much more difficult to assess on the field than you may think. You may, you may think that just go to these mines and see whether the people die earlier or whatever. It is, conf uh, well, there's a lot of confounding factors with poverty and, uh, and, and social disruption in these environments. And it's very difficult to disentangle the, uh, the causes, the, the true causes, whether the metals themselves or the causes or the health effects. Now we did two studies, two case studies, and the, this one is probably the most famous one which we published two years ago in Nature Sustainability. It is about yeah, that artisanal mining of cobalt. So what happened, the, the anecdote is that we were called by the, the, the Belgian consul in Lumumbashi to uh, identify what's going on in Kolwezi. Kolwezi is to the west of Lumumbashi, and where only in 2014, somebody discovered a rich cobalt source under his house in a residential area. So if you Google Kazulo, that's an area there, you can find what this all caused. This was complete social disruption. It's almost unbelievable what happened there. People were digging under their houses, making holes five meters deep. The streets collapsed because of the, uh, uh, all these uh, physical things that can happen. And um, the people were, of course, exposed to all the mining uh, elements. So the, the cobalt, but also uranium and radon gas that is uh, there. So it is an um, incredible situation. It was not so easy to take samples, but uh, because some people were very aggressive when we took the samples because we were interfering with their activities. So we, did, we split the area between a control area in the town and a mining area. We did biomonitoring, and again, we found here, red is exposed and green is the reference control area, but the same town that there was a very high exposure. Mind you, the log scale and here the 100 micrograms per liter. Yeah, even some values to one milligram per liter. And again, in children, children and not the creuseur, not the people who are under the ground, but the children again would pick up these small particles and, and, and eat them that uh, we have that high uh, exposure. Same for uranium, although to a smaller extent than cobalt. Cobalt is really a nice indicator of, of being exposed to activities. The blood is, of course, the most physiological, most important, and, and the urine. Blood samples is more difficult to take than urine. Urine, everybody is willing to provide a sample. Blood is more difficult. You need a lot of permissions, and there is, but there is a very good um, correlation between two. And what we found then for the first time was an, an indicator of damage. So an, an by biomonitoring, it's a biochemical index that is a, a marker of oxidative damage to the DNA. And we found that indeed with increased cobalt exposure, the red dots is the people are exposed in the, in, the, in the area where there is a lot of mining. And this is the control area. You see there is almost no threshold, but with, there is much more DNA damage than uh, in, this, in these children. That was the first thing. And then, of course, the, the, the DNA damage is one thing to go to what it means in terms of uh, life expectancy, uh, development and neurological disorders and so on. That is much less clear. Another study that was already initiated with uh, money from 11.11.11, so the uh, NGO in, 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 in Flanders here, and that we took on board also, that we continued in our VLIR project was this one. 
there was reports in Mubashi that there was quite some a substantial number of bird defects. So I warn you, the, the, the picture that I will show you is uh, not such a nice picture. It's about bird defects. People, children born, uh, newborns have so, uh, these, these the disorders, these bird de uh, uh, defects. And the question was, is it related to mining or not? And what we set up is a, what we call a case control study is when there is a newborn with birth defects that we would take also a sample of a normal child, a controlled child at the same time in the same hospital with the same operator. And that means the same samples and the same questionnaires to both. So because of yeah, when you do questionnaires, there's always a lot of mal reporting. So it's statistically it's made with that case control thing. And we were asking about their activities. We would take, take samples from urine, from father and mother, from blood, from the uh, maternal blood, the child blood, and also from the, the cord blood. So we also took samples. What came out of that, so here are the, yeah, the, these malformations, of which, of course, a lot of genetic effects are included. So it is very difficult, to, well, we, um, with the help of a lot of uh, pedi uh, pediatric doctors, we uh, try to classify the disorders uh, from genetics and the ones that are maybe environmentally related. And what statistically came out is this here in the multivariate model, um, which also accounts for all confounding factors, is that this is what we call the odds ratio, the chance of having a, um, an, a birth defect at, uh, in a child when you take vitamins, then the odds ratio is 0.3. That means that you have much less chance. So if, if the mother took vitamins during the pregnancy, then the, uh, this may indicate, of course, welfare, then there's much less risk for birth defects. And here is the things that we found. The mother with a paid job and the father with mining-related job and a doubling of manganese in the cord blood, so exposure to metals, increased the risk. And these are all statistically significant. Of course, there's a lot of interpretation around because surprisingly we found no relation with cobalt. We did find also correlation with the location from where the mother are. So there's more of these bird uh, defects when the people came from the mining area than if they came from the residential areas where there was no mining effect. But these are the most important ones. And our interpretation is that indeed it is related to exposure to the, to the, to the mines surprisingly the father so there was there's a question whether there's epigenetic effects at the gp if there's effects on the father that goes to the uh, dna of the father and then into the sperm and to the and into the child and to the newborn summary of our findings what is very clear is that there is a huge cobalt exposure in the general population and mainly in children so we know and it's the cobalt is an is a very robust indicator of exposure to the activities. So we can use that easily. The dust is the major exposure route, not drinking water or the food. It is of course drinking water or the food is something, but dust is a major exposure route. Sometimes the dust contains crystals of cobalt sulfate near mining, uh, sorry, smelting operating sites. We found crystals of, pink crystals of cobalt sulfate on the ground or near the water. And of course, that's logical when you just eat that, then you have just pure cobalt that you take in. At a larger scale, the health impact of cobalt is yet unclear. You may be, of course, you may be surprised to hear that after all our studies, but we still don't know truly what the risk is of cobalt. And many people are interested because maybe in 10 years from now, half of the people attending here will drive a car run by a lithium cobalt battery. And still we don't know the true risk of cobalt. We know when, when it's a fine particle that you can have a heart lung disease. We know that there is cardiac diseases potential when you have high cobalt exposure. But we know at the moment that yes, there's more birth defects in around the mining, but the true cause where the cobalt is a true cause, we, we cannot clearly pinpoint that. We know that there is DNA damage in children exposed to mining activity, but if it's really only cobalt related or if it is related to the radon gas, we still don't know that, yeah? But we have seen these reproductive effects and DNA damage. 
um, maybe above all these health effects, the social disruption that the whole artisanal mining caused in, in Kolwezi is, is, is more important. I mean, fights and alcohol and drugs and, and prostitution are omnipresent there for people who have been there. They know what it is. And that's maybe more important at the moment than these health effects that, that we, we do see. But um, at, as a scientist, this is the things that we have been uh, finding. Okay, so the answer to the questions was number three, the dust is a major exposure, not the water, and it's not neurological effects we did not find. Um, we have submitted already some proposals to learn about that, but it is the intake of dust and then the, um, the, uh, the DNA damage is a clear cut effect that we have been, uh, um, that we have been finding. Yeah, I thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Smolders. Um, very interesting presentation where indeed uh, we see um, surprisingly maybe that the dust is uh, the major cause of, of contamination and uh, major cause of, of impacts. Um, I looked also at uh, the questions that we have received, um, but it was also a question whether the, the water uh, would have an, in the end a greater influence um, on the area than, than the dust. So that's an old question that needs to be I think also. Um, also a question, was there a difference between um, the cobalt mining, is there a, a, a comparison between cobalt mining uh, before or after? Is there a, a comparison in that area? Um, I also, in between uh, Charlotte's sharing the screen, I briefly saw also that the, uh, the drawing that Iris is making is, is proceeding quite nicely. So if you want to have a look at her, you can click on her screen and to have a closer look. Um, thank you very much, Professor Smolders. Let's uh, go straight ahead to um, the next presentation by Alberto Vasquez Ruiz. Um, Alberto is a good colleague and, and friend of mine. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce him here. Uh, he has a master in communication sciences and in conflict and development uh, from the University of Ghent. And he specialized in topics related to mining and electronics. Uh, he's also, and that's where we've been working closer together, he's a project coordinator for CATAPA in the Horizon 2020 project NEMO, in which he assesses the social impact of the implementation of technologies aiming at the revalorization of mine tailings. Very interesting project, obviously. Uh, but today he will take us to Bolivia uh, and from Bolivia all around through the world, uh, where he will um, Introduce us towards um, steps towards a fairer supply chain on a fact finding mission to Oruro, Bolivia. So, please, Alberto, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm going to start sharing my screen. So, attention to all participants. Soon there will be a poll coming up. Okay, good, perfect. You have 20 minutes, Alberto. Thank you very much. I will try to be as fast as possible so we have some time for the questions. Um, um, okay, so we did this research um, as an assignment by the Make ICT Fair Consortium that has been working the last three years, and that is the reason we are having the webinars. And they they ask us to make, to perform this fact finding mission in Nuru in Bolivia um, to trace the supply chain of the minerals they were extracting in that area. Okay, and maybe Tlatka, we can share the poll right now. And one of the minerals we were tracing were the zinc ores and concentrates that were exported from Bolivia. So the question is, if you could indicate which are the main importers of that Bolivian zinc ore concentrates. Keep voting, keep voting. We see the answers coming in. Already two thirds of participants have voted. Keep going. Okay. 
it's it's been a very interesting race <laughs> of voting. So actually, yeah, everybody is seeing now the results. So actually, the less vote option was the the real one, and this is a very special relation about the importing of Bolivian think or concentrates. Now I'm gonna speak later on, so please remember this result, Japan, the European Union and South Korea. Okay, so I guess everybody knows where is Bolivia, uh, but this research is focused on the Department of Oruro alone, and the Department of Oruro is there in the Andean Plateau, just in the middle between uh, the north in La Paz and the south Potosi. And specifically, we were researching in the Bolivian Tin Belt, uh, a mountain area that is very rich in tin and base metals. Among those base metals, lead and zinc, but also with high quantities of silver, indium, and other metals. Uh, that lake that you can see in the screen was until five years ago the second biggest lake of Bolivia, but since then it's not a lake anymore because it evaporated. Uh, on, among other reasons, climate change, but also due to mining activities. We were researching on several mines operated by cooperative miners. Um, any kind of mine in the area, a state mine, private mine, or cooperative mine, is exploded in two kind of ores. The zinc, silver, lead concentrates, or minerals, and the tin minerals. The, the one in the bottom that has a little bit of coffee color, as they say, that is the tin one. And the other upper is the zinc, silver, lead, more grayish. Um, and this is the reality of the region. On the bottom line, right line, you can see that the majority of the houses are totally abandoned. That was the original town of Japo in the Bolivian mountains. And what you can see on the other side of the river is the mining camp. This is the reality of the area and this reality is spreading. So the original towns are being abandoned because all agriculture, farming and herding of llamas is not longer possible due to the pollution of the water basins, due to the, the lower and lower decreasing levels of groundwater due to the continuous pumping of groundwater to maintain dry the calories of the mines and due to the impossibility of growing potatoes or beans due to climate change. So this is a very bad combination that is spreading. Why is it spreading? Because this, that image, that is the whole area. So those are the mountains uh, where the majority of the mining is being performed. And what you see there, that very white thing that is, pos is possible to see in Google Maps, that is all mining sediments. That is a huge polluted area that is increasing every day. And that is very fine dust. Uh, we know the area because we have been for already 15 years working with local communities affected by these mining activities since many decades ago already. Um, we were installing rainwater tanks that is recognized by the World Health Organization as the best way uh, to have drinking water, not contaminated, because all the groundwater and surface water in that area uh, is above the maximum levels of arsenic, lead, and cadmium, and even harvesting rainwater, we were getting water that was polluted above arsenic and lead levels. This is because of the very fine dust that is everywhere moving with the wind with any kind of stop. So as long or as widespread, this mining sediment and the pollution uh, progress, it's advanced, more and more communities are not able anymore to survive as farmer or yeah, farming communities, indigenous communities, and they engage in the nearby mining sector 
to provide a living for their families in their territory. And it has shaped a very a strong uh, mining cooperative communities with already a long story in Bolivia. So they are organized in a totally legal cooperative structure, but of course they are the owners of their exploitation. They are the owners and workers of, the, of their own uh, galleries. So they are not respecting all the occupational health uh, rules, even for Bolivia. They are not respecting some of the health um, rules they should be uh, following nor safety. You can see that they are working without resp respirators because of course the respirators are very expensive and they rely only on the mineral they can extract. There is no salary, there is no wage. There is only the money they get by selling those minerals to the local traders. You can think that artisanal small scale mining is done in a very antique or artisanal way, but actually uh, cooperative miners can get very well organized if they find rich veins and they of course are working there so they try to permanently improve their operations. So it is not so uh, raw or old school as you might be thinking of artisanal scale mining. Um, they are not only extracting ores inside galleries underground, but they are also concentrating the ore outside. This this photography that you are seeing now on the screen is actually a river bed. It was the bedding of a river in that area and they concentrate the minerals right on the river beds. So unfortunately there is only rain during three months of the year but during the rainy months all the mats that you are seeing is just widespread all around. Of course it was already polluted but it just reinforces reinforce that pollution. The sediments in that plain of the Aurora uh, Plateau, the amount of sediments we are talking is between several centimeters to up to four meters deep. So this is the reality of how the cooperative miners are working with communities downstream that are having very serious issues with widespread increasing groundwater contamination, surface contamination, and also all the dust that everybody is breathing. But also the cooperative miners are not smelting their own metals. The product they are selling finally to international markets is just concentrates. And they are the owners of their own labor, so they are self-exploitating them for living wages. There are several health issues in the mine, outside and, and downstream, as I already mentioned. The safety measures are limited to the minimum necessary to continue the production, so accidents are very often a reality with that. Uh, there are strong gender inequality issues. Uh, for example, in most mines, they don't allow women to work inside the galleries because of traditional back lack uh, thoughts or ideas. But also we heard many stories of women, the women who are working inside being raped as a way of compensating with the miners are not having luck in rich veins inside the galleries. Because of course, the miners totally rely on the amount of rich ores they find. If they don't find rich ores, they are not getting incomes. And yes, that is a reality that is happening. And of course, as I said, it's reinforcing the spread of new mines in the areas because the new communities that cannot longer rely on farming, they engage in opening by themselves new galleries to avoid migrating to the cities and from the cities to other countries. So this kind of situation there 
is also reinforcing the migration from Bolivia to other countries. And finally, what is this happening? And that is the link that Make City Fair wanted from us, the link of these activities there to the rest of the world. Because sometimes we see that these are problems happening in the DRC or in Bolivia of anywhere else, but there is a strong link here with there. Those two kind of minerals you are seeing there being tried are the coffee one is the tin concentrate and the gray one is the silver lead zinc concentrates. They are the same mines because if they find a vein rich in tin, they extract that. But if they find another vein rich in the other kind of ore, they extract that. So it's, those are the same locations. We can say that the supply chain of tin is different than the supply chain of base metals. But actually, most mines are mining several kinds of metals in their ores. And then we started to trace to make the map of that supply chain coming from the from the mines to the suppliers all of them of course the first suppliers in the international chain are the the first traders the local traders the small ones but they of course uh, in the case of tin there is a bolivian smelter a private one and a, and a state one so they are smelting already the metal there and shelling tin in the form of ingots of metal. But for the concentrate of lead, uh, silver, and um, thing, there is no smelter. There is no obligation in the Bolivian state to smelt those concentrates before export. So they mostly export the ore and the concentrate in, in tracks like that or in ingots for the tin to the port and to the foreign smelter and so on to the ICT industry. That was what we had researched uh, last year and we published already in March. And we found that actually, as you can see, uh, the countries of the European Union are representative. My question was about the think, because there we found a strong relation, I'm oh, sorry, a strong relation of Belgium and Spain. So for this year, the request of Mega City Fair was there is a, a strong relation with Belgium. Why don't you further research on that? Uh, because you are a Belgium-based organization. So that was the interesting part for us. Okay, you can see here the Bolivian sport. Actually, Japan is the first one, South Korea, and then the European Union, Belgium and Spain. I'm gonna talk a little bit further about that, but there is a historical reason for this. Think extraction or lead extraction, especially zinc, is a very difficult one because they are carrier metals. So when you smelt them, all other quantities of smaller metals come together with the metal. So actually zinc was only used as brass, copper, uh, zinc for most of the history until the, the 19th century. In the 19th century in Belgium, they started separating for the first time in history the zinc from the other metals. And this is key to understand the relation of Europe with the rest of the world for this kind of concentrates. So we needed to rethink this year the research we have done uh, about that foreign smelter or no. And then we said, okay, maybe it doesn't go direct to the ICT industry. It goes to the ports, like the port factory in this case, then to a primary smelter that it could be here in Belgium, for example, Nistar. And from that primary smelter, okay, they are smelting sink, but in the slack of a smelter that is recovering only one or two metals in that slack, that is like it's rich in other metals. And that is like it's not being landfilled directly because there are other metals that can be recovered from that. And that is good. So we need to extract less metals from the, from the environment first. Um, it goes to secondary smelters where they can recover 
other minerals, like for example, Umicor is a uh, European stand, um, uh, main company doing this. And from there, we found the relation. So actually we are producing indium here in, in Belgium, uh, both refining it directly from the zinc concentrate because zinc concentrates are the biggest sourcing of indium the smelting of zinc concentrates and from the rich concentrates of indium the concentrates coming from bolivia are the are one of the richest concentrates of the world for indium in the zinc concentrates so the this kind of concentrates coming from bolivia are very interesting to recover for the indium and this indium is in Europe being mixed with the tin for the ITO, the Indian tin oxide. And that one is already part of the ICT industry. ITO, Indian tin oxide, is present in the screen you are right now watching. All the flat screen, all the LCD, the touch screens you are using, all of them have a very thin layer of indium tin oxide. So what were our conclusions as a very small organization doing a very small report? That one in the screen is from the last year. Uh, we are going to publish next one uh, at the end of October, if you want more information. So we realized that actually it's very easy to trace the supply chain for the metals. So that, these are our recommendations or conclusions for first public institutions. You really need to request clear due diligence criteria in your procurement contracts because this is not impossible to do. This is actually doable. All the cooperatives we visit, all the local, um, the local suppliers, the, the local traders, were open to a start be monitored to a start being visited in order to assure that the conditions are better so there is the need and the room for a due diligence mechanism with a mandatory base but any mechanism needs to have a monitoring body because who is right now checking the due diligence criteria that is being applied in the companies and any monitoring body needs to, needs to have tools to enforce it. Because if you are just monitoring, but the results of your monitoring has no possibility to, to say to a company, you are doing very well, then those monitoring bodies are not very useful. But my recommendations or the findings of this study we are going to publish at the end of this month, I think for private companies are the most interesting because due diligence is actually not really being implemented. The traders of these concentrates, of, of this source, of these metals have the complete data because in the export of the metals, they are already saying the origin, the quantities, the percentage and so on, and the concentration of the metals. And that kind of information come in the ships with the bill of lading so the final customer the final smelter in europe in china in japan or south korea gets the information the whole information about those minerals this kind of work implies very few resources look what katapa could achieve in such a, such a short time and funds and nobody in the thing lit or indium sector is doing any better it doesn't matter if it is Belgium if it is China, if it is Japan or South Korea. So for all the private sector here present, this is a very clear statement. Your company can drive a real change because nobody is offering a real engagement to certify, look, we are monitoring this whole chain with public and with uh, NGO areas. Um, we can for sure say, our sources is totally fair. There is nobody being uh, violated in their human rights or in their environment. 
and this is the title of the study we will be publishing at the end of the month if you want to be uh, informed about the actual concrete data on the indium for the european union thank you very much Thank you very much, Alberto, for a very interesting presentation in which you managed to uncover the links between uh, artisanal small-scale mining and the global uh, markets, the global value chain, and also to the picture where the little Belgium, which is sometimes not that little, is featured there. Um, I was wondering in, in your presentations whether the Bolivians know about the presence of indium in their zinc concentrates. Um, a very clear plea also for mandatory due diligence mechanism and a call for um, the private sector to step it up and to drive that real change that we are aiming for. Um, thank you very much to all three speakers for the very interesting presentations. Um, uh, we had received a, a few questions. Um, maybe Professor Schmolders, there was a question about uh, the impact of uh, the cobalt and the chicken. Can you briefly comment on this? Yeah, the question was whether we also sampled around the large scale mining operations and the answer is yes. So um, for the exposure, the dust ingestion study and the just the general in, in exposure assessment, that was around all the mining sites, well, many mining sites in um, Lubumbashi and Likasi. Um, where there is uh, for people who have been there, also these, the Jekamin is there, the, so the original, the, well, and the, still the, the Congolese, uh, uh, the company who took over from uh, Union Miniere. But also you have these uh, South African uh, miners there um, around, so we have not been on the mines, of course, of the large scale mines, but around the mines and the, the people living around these mines. Uh, um, and what I've what I remember also in, in Lubumbashi, we went um, to a place where there was a smelting operation, so a large scale smelting operation, and people living uh, near the, the brick wall of the smelter, uh, they were heavily exposed to cobalt because from that, um, from that smelter, there was a, a leakage of um, a cobalt sulfur and sulfuric acid in the groundwater. And with bicapillary rice, um, the there was cobalt sulfate cobalt sulfate accumulation in the house so inside the houses you could also see these crystals so the capillary rise from the heavily contaminated groundwater um, was, was reaching and um, the smell of so2 was unbearable i mean it's uh, we also did some some studies on the level of so2 in the air but i um, mean you don't need an instrument you can hardly breathe around this uh, uh, um, up around this smelter, that, but that's in Lubumbashi. But the answer is yes, we did also that around large scale mines. So, so it's definitely not only with artisanal mining um, associated. But of course, that that study, that Colwesi case, that's a particular case of artisanal small scale mining. Um, that is that is uh, that's not a big mining operation. Huh? Um, and where we th we suspect that the major source of exposure is in fact the dust in the houses. The people are digging up the, the minerals and bring them inside the houses. The bags are just laying in the houses. The people sleep on the bags. Uh, so you can imagine the radon exposure being very high uh, because I mean the, the uranium uh, is high in uranium and so then you have natural radon gas that, 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 that uh, develops there in the houses. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment on this uh, very um, impactful conditions in, in DRC. Um, Boris, a question to you. Uh, there was uh, one of the participants who um, would like to highlight some of the initiatives that were on the ground that implement uh, or try to implement responsible sourcing programs. Um, you have recently also the conflict minerals regulation of European Commission, which will actually um, officially be launched or be in vigor from the beginning of next year. I don't know if you can comment briefly on those issues. Um, yes, so with regards to the, the issue of, um, the, the, because the, the, the question was about um, the fact that formalization is possible. And indeed, I'm not saying that formalization is not possible. Um, I was only saying that in a lot of cases, formalization has a rather narrow scope, focusing not necessarily on the issues that, that matter most, namely decent work and, and labor rights. Uh, and there is indeed a difference between gold and the 
um, the other the treaties, um, so tin, tantalum, tungsten, um, because there indeed, I mean, the, the strong focus on Central Africa in particular seems to be uh, bearing fruit in the sense that there are an increasing number of initiatives, an increasing number of, of formal minds. Um, with regards to the EU regulation, because this is an important question, I think it's also related to uh, to what um, what Alberto was saying about due diligence. Uh, I'm not a, a, an expert on this, um, but what I do know, I mean, in essence, the EU regulation tries to impose uh, and will enter into force next year, tries to impose due diligence obligations on importers of treaty um, and gold. Um, so basically due diligence, you, you need to identify, assess, um, you need to address, you need to, um, you need to monitor and you need to communicate about the ways in which you as a company avoid um, conflict minerals from ending up in your supply chain. So there's a couple of critical reflections that can be made. And again, I mean, I think there's other people who are better placed to do so than I am, but I will still try. Uh, so first of all, I think one of the issues could be the limited scope. Um, so the focus is on, on smelters, refiners, which we don't have a lot of in Europe and on importers, um, but a lot of downstream companies, including in the electronics industry would basically be left out of the, the, the equation. So that's one challenge. For instance, I'm not sure about this, but I heard that Umicore, um, Umicore itself would not be included, which of course raises some questions about the scope. I might be wrong here, but uh, there is an indication that it's not really clear. Um, the other the other issue is also that it focuses really on, on conflict, uh, on high risk areas, conflict affected areas. So in that sense, uh, the question would also be whether the issues addressed, for instance, by Alberto uh, would actually be covered by this law because Bolivia, as far as I know, is not a conflict affected or high risk area. Uh, although again, this is something that might be considered because um, let's say that um, grave human rights violations could also be a reason to include uh, countries on, on this list. Uh, second, second critical reflection would be whether the underlying assumptions are right. If you deprive armed actors of access to revenues coming from three Ts, uh, wouldn't they just turn to other revenues? And, and gold is there the, the primary um, the primary question because gold is much easier to uh, to smell, to smuggle, and to somehow um, whitewash into this this global trading system. So what you see, and, and again, my colleague Sarah again, for instance, is a better place to judge this, uh, but what you see is that the, while the initiatives in, in Central Africa are having effect, a lot of the actors are turning to gold. Uh, so in that sense, that's an unintended effect of these policies. And then a last reflection, and I think probably the most important one is that there's always the risk of what is what is called a de facto embargo. Uh, and that was based on the experience with the US.Frank Act, but I will not go into detail on that one. Uh, but essentially, even if the EU would try to avoid this, there's always a risk that companies will simply say, okay, artisanal mining is too risky. We cannot, uh, we cannot risk being associated with this type of risky uh, activity. The fact that it's conflict related, the fact that it's, uh, it raises a lot of human rights questions. So a lot of companies would rather choose not to work with artisanal miners and of course this can have a detrimental impact on their livelihoods. So in that sense I think any legal initiative should be coupled with initiatives to also work together with artisanal miners. Um, and I think that's why I raised these, these examples of the Fair ICT, um, uh, the Fair Cobalt Alliance yep. and, um, and Craft because that's exactly what they try to do. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I see Alberto nodding a lot. I don't know if you would like to comment on this. Please go ahead. Um, I just was to comment on, on what um, Boris just said. So that is a reality, no? Uh, the picture I, I gave, I had mentioned several times that there are also state and private companies also operating in that area. And they are not doing better. They are doing better in some areas, like they provide a decent salary to the miners. But on the other side, the environmental implication of those operations are way higher than the ones the cooperative miners are doing, because the technologies or the techniques that the cooperative miners are using are low impact for the environment, or low impact. I mean, lower than the ones the big private and state companies are uh, are are doing so. If you see some of the private private companies, like the one of Lincoln over there, or the one of the state in Finto, those environmental impacts are huge or are bigger than the ones by the cooperative mines. So if we say, okay, let's just stop artisanal small uh, scale mining because that is bad. Yeah, that is not uh, a solution. 
because the other mines have also very big issues. And actually, who are buying the minerals that those, those cooperative miners are producing? Okay. Two of the cooperatives we asked, they were selling directly to the, to the mine of Lencore over there. And the other ones were almost selling finally to the same international trader, Trafigura or Korea Sync. So finally, there were only three customers, three international traders for all the mines, those yeah. three that I have mentioned. So finally, it's the same business, the, the same three companies who are managing the whole sector. Yeah. Very interesting indeed, Alberto, to to unveil these uh, these networks. And, and there you see that very often the intermediates are um, I wouldn't call them the usual suspects, but uh, I think I just did. Uh, one final question for Alberto. It's, I'm also looking at the time. Uh, yes, I can very briefly because yes, there's one ahead. thing because we always focus on the EU conflict minerals regulation, but it's also important to note that there's a bigger uh, legislative push in Europe for uh, mandatory due diligence legislation, and this could potentially cover some of the the lacuna that I just uh, identified. So it would focus on, I mean, on more companies, including the ones that are not directly importing uh, minerals. But this is this still remains to be seen while the, the minerals regulation will be there next year. So that's a certainty. And the new regulation is uh, still under negotiation? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a promise made by our commissioner, uh, Didier Renders, and it is something that most people are convinced of that will be there in, in the coming years, but what it will look like and which companies would be covered, that's something that is up to debate. Yep. That's the political question. Thank you. Maybe final question and we go back from the global to the local scale. There was a question uh, on the chat box um, where for Alberto, um, if he knows about any cases of workers that were switching between farming and mining to sustain their livelihood based on the season. Is mining then as such also seasonal work? If you can briefly definitely. comment on this. Yeah, yeah definitely. Because actually, um, being the workers, uh, cooperative workers, um, they are associated so they are like autonomous worker being associated each other for the same uh, mining sites. So they are working when they can invest the hours. Most of them are only working in the mines, but most of them have also also other kind of commitments. Some of them were even studying in the university, uh, but it was their main the to survive. Let's say to to have enough money to to pay for their education, um, the livelihoods. Other people were farmers still living in the area. And these mines were like the only way of complementing their income. So they are cooperative miners. So they are not attached to a working hours scheme. So indeed, in many, many cases, it was seasonal. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think now we've got the debate really started um, because I see many more questions incoming. Unfortunately, we have to stop it here. Um, nevertheless, let this webinar not be the end of this very interesting discussion. First of all, there's a, another webinar tomorrow uh, linked to the same series. Um, and I'd like to uh, emphasize here also that we'll have a, a short report that will be shared with all the participants uh, after the webinar on the Blogspot uh, short report. We'll also share the, the graphic drawing that Iris is making. Um, which you can have a look on the, the images. So there you see also the program of tomorrow appearing. Um, and we'll invite the speakers also to share uh, their presentation if they would allow us to, or if they can share a brief presentation. Also have a look at the chat box where I see several uh, very interesting studies have been added. Uh, I mentioned, I added the studies that uh, Professor Smolders has mentioned in his presentation, same for the one of Alberto, and there's a, another one uh, from Fairphone, which was also very interesting, I think. So I will leave it here. I would like to thank uh, you all very much for your very active participation. Um, this was a, a webinar in which you had at least four clicks. So it's a little bit more active than usual, at least from the webinars that I participate to. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending. I hope it was very interesting for you. Please keep in touch. Uh, the organizers will send you emails with reports of the events. And a special thanks, of course, to my three male speakers, uh, Boris, Alberto, and Eric. Um, thanks very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, P2, for this excellent moderation. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Pete. Yes. Thank thanks. you very much, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.